session ninth or session of uh, today. And we left off at the end of the last uh, session talking about the about the putting away of the foreign wives. Now, assumption, pagan wives who had not renounced their idolatrous practices that were uh, leading uh, men within Israel in particular, more than women, to, uh, uh, to embrace, not turn away completely from Yahweh, but to embrace idolatry and abominable practices that went along with them. The solution, and I hinted at it at the very end, that in this uh, situation they had married women particularly when you think in terms of the original requirements in the Torah of women who should not have remained alive anyway. So that these were, to a certain extent, marriages that never should have taken place in the first, uh, in the first instance. And uh, so at this point, it's not putting the women to death uh, because they had Canaanite background, uh, but it was uh, giving them a, a uh, divorce, sending them away, but at the same time, uh, as a matter of keeping Torah, uh, taking care of them as well. Now, by the time we get to, uh, to Ezra's day, we're not talking about literal Canaanites, but the same thing is true, that if, if there is no way, and these, these were women that were, if we might put this way, uh, had, had become solidified in their idolatrous uh, belief and practices, abominable practices, that there is really no hope for their salvation. Therefore, they do contaminate the Holy Seed. And seeing how pervasive this already become, if allowed to continue, the result would have been internally exactly what Ezra feared, and that is basically the end of Abraham's race, the, the holy seed and the, the, uh, the uh, heirs of the Abrahamic covenant and promise that God had promised to, to bless, uh, and uh, through them to bless all the nations, and this all ties in to then the Abrahamic seed becoming the nation of Israel, and the nation of Israel itself being a, a blessing to the nations in the future, a true holy nation, as uh, God had called them to be, a kingdom of priests representing God to the nations and the nations to God, that that would all be defeated, God's plan and purpose for the physical seed of Abraham, if this was allowed to continue. So based upon God's program, this had to be in this situation, the, uh, uh, the, the means, as it were, to, to purify the holy race. Now, this was true of physical Israel in the physical land in the year 458, 457 B.C. And we can see the same thing taking place a generation later in about 425 B.C. with uh, Nehemiah, though at that point there is no, um, there, there is no uh, renouncing of uh, the marriages, just a confrontation of those that had done so in Nehemiah chapter 13. And Ezra, knowing Torah, sanctions this. This is in line with God's instruction to Israel at Sinai, Practically, imply, uh, practically applied uh, and uh, to the situation that he faced. Now, fast forward, we now are in the year 2020, and we are part of uh, the Confessing Church of Jesus Christ, and uh, we are no longer under the commandments given to Israel at Sinai. We are not physical heirs, but spiritual heirs of the promise given to Abraham. 
the whole Abrahamic agenda and its impact upon the nations as a holy nation, as a kingdom of priests, of what God has designed, we believe, in the future for the kingdom age, is no longer incumbent upon us as believers in Jesus Christ. And we do have clear teaching, apostolic teaching, that uh, Paul himself says does not go back to Jesus Christ, but he has the, the, the mind of God and uh, can, can give instruction. And that instruction is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And so what happens if a Christian believer finds themselves married to, an un, uh, to a non-Christian, which, as Paul addresses that, uh, could be reality. He's talking to first-generation Christians in Corinth. He is, uh, he is sending this letter to them just within a few years after their conversion. So uh, he recognizes the fact that uh, there were some who were called, became Christians, who found themselves in a marriage to a non-believer. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 10, but to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, in verse 11, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. We are not Israel of Ezra's day. We are the church of Jesus Christ, and God's instruction to us to his glory is the instruction of Paul. Now, if the believer wants to depart, let them go. Let them depart. The believer is no longer under bondage. But, but if uh, the unbelieving partner wants to stay, then they are to maintain the, the marriage. Uh, for verse 16... How do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And uh, by the way, maintain the marriage, verse 14, because your children otherwise would be unclean, but now they are holy. It has, uh, it has an impact, and don't notice that they are now holy. Again, there is the same concern of Ezra chapter 10 for holiness. I said apartness. And uh, so because of the impact it might have upon your children. And who knows about the salvation of your partner? They might not be confirmed in their, uh, in, in their idolatrous condition, that is, embracing another God besides the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, who knows? And, of course, uh, particularly for women, First Peter you know, gives, the, uh, uh, gives the instruction in First uh, Peter chapter 3 that... Uh, even without a word, as non-believing husbands see your chaste and, and holy behavior, they might be led to, uh, to come to faith in, in Christ. Uh, and that is key because uh, in the Roman world, and of course now we're dealing with Romans 13, the laws of the state, it's very interesting that, uh, that a woman was called upon to follow the religious dictates of her husband. That was a legal requirement. And so that really the only way a Christian woman could give testimony to, to her husband was by her behavior uh, rather than probably by word. Now, a husband was in a stronger position that, uh, uh, that if the wife wanted to maintain the relationship, uh, she, could, she could give verbal assent to his Christian faith without, without necessarily embracing it. Uh, the man had a stronger legal position, uh, those to whom Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But a basic principle, I think, is verse 17, as the Lord has assigned each one as God has called, in that manner let him walk. That is, if you're called, circumcised, or you use a circumcised or uncircumcised, or married or unmarried, maintain that... Uh, that relationship, if, if you entered into your Christian faith with a non-Christian spouse, then as much as you can maintain that. Now, going forward, obviously gives instruction to those in the Lord 
be careful whom you marry. In fact, it's better advice because of what the Corinthians were facing is uh, stay unmarried, although I realize most can't take that. So if you do just marry in the Lord, you have not sinned. So that's the instruction we come under. And so obviously, as Christians, knowing 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we read and hear Ezra 10, and that's what I've had. Men come and say, well, I had a non-Christian partner. I did everything I could to maintain the relationship. I had no heart to put them away. This seems to be so cold, so heartless. I mean, is, is this God's commandment to me? And my answer is, no, it's not. You're not a Jew in Yehud in 458, 457 B.C. married to a non-Christian, a non-believer. You come under 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But don't take your experience of saying, because I wouldn't do that, then there's something wrong with what God, God commanded Israel to do in Ezra chapter 10. It was, wasn't wrong under those circumstances for God's greater good, God's greater glory. In the same way, God in this age has called you to his standard for your greater good and for his glory as well. But you come under 1 Corinthians 7. You don't come under Ezra 10. And that's my basic answer to the quote-unquote ethical dilemma that Christians face as they read Ezra chapter 10. And you can, again, read Gospel if you want a little you know, further insight, basically, basically taking the same basic position. All right, any questions? I understand I, I've given, in some way, uh, I hope, a, a simple answer to what could be a very complex issue that would arise in the ministry circumstance, but I think it is the foundation, you know, that uh, get, get, get this basic truth that Ezra 10 is for believers but not to believers. It reminds us Ezra 9 and 10, it, it, it reminds us of the importance of marriage, marriage to a believer, marriage in the Lord, doing it God's way. And doing it God's way so you have to go back and live with the repercussions for them putting away their wives, maybe the reper re repercussions of not having you know, the most uh, God-honoring, God-glorifying marriage that you could have if you entered into a union with a, with a non-believer. But, uh, but God gives us this instruction for our good, and don't have this, this jarring reaction as, as you read Ezra 10, like somehow that was wrong. Uh, that can be one response, or the other response is, am I under Ezra 10, and therefore my unbelieving wife doesn't want to convert to, to Christ or husband, therefore I should divorce them? No, they're willing to live with you. I mean, you're under 1 Corinthians 7, not under Ezra chapter 10. What glorifies God in this age is different than what glorified God uh, uh, 2,400 years ago. That's my basic answer. And thank you. The students are nodding their heads, so I think we can move on, except uh, <laughs> Justin, <laughs> Justin has, a, has a question. Uh, well... He, he does say in there, um, let it do according to the law. And I was just looking earlier at uh, Exodus 22:20, 20, where it says, He who sacrifices to any other god uh, other than the Lord alone shall be utterly destroyed. Um, would that be something that Ezra w would have had in mind? Um, and, and in light of that... Right. If, if okay, yes. If, if this is maintained... And so the question is Exodus 22, and, and, and of course that's addressing an Israelite. That is, that's not addressing you know, a pagan. But uh, this was to be done in Israel, and it was also to be done to a pagan in Israel, uh, uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 12. Anyone who brings idolatry into Israel is to be put to death. And um, so you don't, you, you, you don't go to pagan nations and say, you're idolaters, you need, to be, uh, you need to be put to death. But if that's brought in to Israel, yes, the, anyone who would practice or counsel the worship of an idol is to be put to death. And so, yes, I think that is the ramification that is here. 
that if the woman is in the midst of Israel, technically that is what should take place. Therefore, the better thing is, is to put her away and have her depart back to her own people. So she, she, again, that's, I think, where that tinge of grace. And you got to realize the situation has changed in Ezra chapter 10. That is, not only are they governed by the law of God, they're also governed by the law of Persia. And even though we said, yeah, they're basically in concert together. Um, I think short of adultery, uh, the Israelites would have had a problem with the Persians putting to death a wife that, that there's other means of putting away by means of divorce. Uh, so they, they are bound by Scripture. That is their first, you know, that, that, that's, the, that's their foundation. But they also can't be doing something that goes against Persian regulations as well. So they're, they're, they are bound in a certain way by like we are with Romans 13, they are also bound by the laws of the land. So they are not an autonomous nation in Yehud. They are a province of Persia. And so whatever they do in conformity with Scripture also has to be in conformity with Persian law. And that, that's a good point because that, that is very apropos to our situations today, that we're bound by both by both the Word of God and the outworking of that. And that's one of the reasons today that, um, at least in the American society, that uh, you, you could say, well, biblically, if your spouse commits adultery, adultery under the law was a death penalty. Well, gentlemen, if, if, <laughs> if you as a pastor counsel a man or a woman who comes to you and said, I have evidence, in fact, my, my spouse will testify they've committed adultery. I want them dead. I don't think you should put them to death on your church grounds under the laws of the United States. Uh, you could say, well, yeah, biblically, mm, yeah, divorce is serious. And if we were Old Testament Israel, you could call for the death penalty. But we're not Old Testament Israel. We're New Testament church you know, here in the San Fernando Valley. And so we're going to have to temper what is in Scripture with what is allowable under the statutes of the, of the civil government in which we live. You talk about Christian. I, well, let's say, boy, if, if next weekend we had a, a public execution of all adulterers in our churches, um, that I, I think that would make CNN. Um, it would certainly yeah, it would put their narrative. You're right, but uh, but nevertheless, uh, so these are uh, again these these are considerations that have to be taken, and considerations that have to be taken place in Ezra chapter ten. They, they're bound by Scripture, but also the outworking of Scripture uh, based upon the. Um, uh, the circumstances they found themselves under with Persian law as well. So even uh, Ezra being appointed as it were as representative of the king uh, could only go so far in that uh, in, in, in what he could and could not allow. Again, I think if there would have been a public execution in Jerusalem of all these women, you know, you're like, can I should not fit to live? Uh, and did they or did they, have, were they invited into Israel? Did they become part of, of um, uh, were they in Israel? Did, uh, again, how, how much they could put into practice, Exodus 22 is also bound by Persian law. Well, let's move into the next narrative block that uh, we uh, will look at. Sorry about that, just as everything is moving slowly and quickly. All right, here's the next narrative block we've already talked about. There is a debate upon on uh, whether we uh, see the ending of the block in Chapter 6, because obviously, as we're introduced in Nehemiah Chapter 1, the 
the wall is the uh, is uh, the issue, the wall and uh, the the gates. And by the end of chapter six, the wall is completed, and uh, very very significantly. Uh, and I I would say chapter one gives us the sovereignty of God in. Nehemiah's position, he was the cupbearer of the king. And uh, then in chapter uh, uh, 6, when the wall is completed, verse 16, the nations lost their confidence for they recognized this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So again, you can, you can see the sovereign hand of God at the beginning and the end of this narrative as well. Or do we... Uh, uh, do we include uh, chapter 7 because not only the walls but also the, uh, uh, the gates. And you come to chapter 7, verse 1, and uh, the wall was rebuilt and I set up the doors and the gatekeepers, etc. And, um, and uh, so the, the functioning, as it were, of uh, the city is complete. Everything the walls, the gates represent. Uh, by the time you, uh, you get to uh, chapter uh, uh, 7. So what do you do? And, of course, the grand inclusio. Uh, does chapter 7 go with what went before? That would seem to, in one sense, be the answer yes, and yet on the other sense it is the answer no. And chapter 7 would now the need for population. That's why the, <coughs> that's why the, uh, the, the uh, list is given again to be the foundation for chapter 11 on those that are going to move to Jerusalem. It can go both ways, and uh, I've gone both ways in my outline in the past, and like I said, uh, this one I'll just go and, and end, end the narrative block at, uh, at the end of chapter 6. So that is the, the need for the wall and the completion of the wall, <clears throat> and uh, all being accomplished again according to plan and purpose of God. That was seen because of Nehemiah's position in chapter 1 and seen by the, by the opponents in chapter 6 when the wall is completed. This can only be explained by God's sovereignty. So we're right back to the previous two uh, divisions of the book as well. So even this, it's God's sovereign hand and uh, within the, uh, the text itself, uh, verse 8, of chapter 2, the last sentence, the king granted them to me, says Nehemiah, because the good hand of my God was upon me. In 2.18, as he gathers together the people in Jerusalem, I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's word, words which he had spoken to me. So internally as well, we've got Nehemiah in his own words stating again, that he understands the sovereign hand of God that was directing in the affairs, in his dealings with Artaxerxes, and then based upon Artaxerxes' decision, what he is able to do for God in leading the people and giving them the authority to be able to, com to rebuild the walls and reestablish the security of Jerusalem. So we're not left again without God being the hero of the narrative. So in all of the facts, don't forget, it's, it's God who is directing all of this to the end that he has determined according to his sovereign plan, you know, for his ultimate honor and, and glory. Well, that uh, then leads us, uh, and again, I followed uh, Goswell at this point. He followed, he followed the Masoretic text. Now, my sermons, actually, I did chapter 1 and 2 together. It can, it can be done. I mean, the, 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 the Masoretic division is not inerrant. It's a guide. It, it is not the last word of the Holy Spirit on how to interpret the passage. And uh, so I base my, my, my message on the fact that at the very beginning we're introduced to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the broken uh, damn wall and the gates burn with fire. And uh, that is repeated in chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, Jerusalem is desolate, its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall. And so you kind of have an inclusio there. Uh, this is the situation, 
and Nehemiah has returned to resolve that situation. So you, could, you can literally end uh, that first uh, movement, that first segment at the end of chapter 2, and then the actual rebuilding of the wall to its end takes place, chapters 3 through 6. So uh, again, in dealing with narrative, you kinda, you, you're looking at it, and, and sometimes, as I said, the, the divisions aren't hard and fast. It's not like didactic literature. But even didactic literature, you know, can at times have a summarization which also lays the foundation of what's going to come uh, afterwards as well. Uh, so you can go either way. The, the outline isn't the inerrant word of God, but, uh, but at least tying into what we want to discuss today because there really, there's really two parts uh, to what happens in 1, 1 to 2, 8. Chapter 1, if I can put it this way, is is Nehemiah's receiving the information concerning Jerusalem and his response to God. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, is that same information now being the backdrop to his response to the king. So, chapter 1, Nehemiah hears what's happening, and so he speaks to the king, and having spoken to the king of kings, he then speaks to the king of Persia, not king of kings, as Xerxes called himself in Ezra 7. And, uh, and, and both were necessary. Talks to the king of kings first, and then needs to talk to the king. Well, what did he hear? We've already given the, uh, the chronological information. He is concerned, as you uh, see in verse 2, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. He's concerned with the people first, but he's also concerned about the city. Now, being a cupbearer to the king, he's probably been privy somewhat to the interactions of Ezra with Artaxerxes. Remember, this is, this is uh, uh, yes, a letter for Ezra, but it's a, it's a, public, uh, it's a public document. It's a, it's a, it's a well-known document. He's a counsel of the kings, and, and, and particularly with his Jewish her heritage, he's concerned with the king's interaction that has taken place. He would also be aware of the letters that we've read in Ezra chapter 4. So the letters of Ezra 4 and the decree of Ezra 7, we have to assume Nehemiah knows as we come to Nehemiah chapter 1. Again, there is this link. That even if you see two books... You really can't understand Nehemiah without seeing the historical link. So it might not be literary. I think it's literary. It's all one book. But, okay, even if, even if you think it's this historical link, it's still an important link. you still got to speak about this. And, by the way, uh, uh, Thomas and, and Hamilton, uh, uh, both of them don't give any indication of necessarily holding to, to one book. They talk about the Jewish tradition. But significantly, they, they preached Ezra first and then Nehemiah, and when they get to Nehemiah, they do, they see the historical links back to Ezra. I mean, they, they bring this up. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not a voice crying in the wilderness, but I'm the only one who's discovered this. Uh, it's, uh, it, it hasn't been traditional, I'm sorry to say, but I think it is when the last generation, I think as you get into expositions of Nehemiah, they do speak they do see, I think, the accurate links back to what is in Ezra. Again, with literary historic, at the end, I'm not going to argue. Um, as long as they see historic, then I'm fine. So you can begin preaching with Nehemiah. I will, not, uh, I will not rip up your degree from Masters. If you do show the links back historically to what has been recorded in Ezra. Now, if you never make a mention of Ezra and start preaching Nehemiah, I might be tempted <laughs> to uh, change your grade on the transcript. All right, which could lead to the enunciation of your degree, but nevertheless. 
And I say it with a smile. <laughs> I would never do that. But he's concerned. And I think he's concerned uh, because he's aware. Now, to get the chronology, Ezra's returned, whether, whether Nehemiah knows about the intermarriage issue or not, he knows that uh, Ezra and those who went with him have taken the mandate about the temple as being security also for the city. And based upon that authority, have started to rebuild the walls. He knows about the letter that has come informing Artaxerxes of that because he's a counsel of the king. And he knows what Artaxerxes' response has been. And to what involvement, because we do know that from the month uh, Chislev in the 20th year to the month Nisan, basically from the ninth to the first month of the, of the new calendar, there's a four-month gap between Nehemiah's reception of the news and his, and his being called again into the king's presence, which shows his cupbearer he is not with the king every day. Now, tied in with that is the fact that the Persian kings had multiple palaces. They did not live continually in the same place. So Nehemiah might have been you know, publicly assigned to Susa, and when the king is not there, well, you stay in Susa, uh, whether he was part of the traveling entourage or not. I mean, the, these are all questions we can't answer, but it is indicative of the fact that, that when the letters you know, came to uh, uh, the letter of uh, Ezra chapter 4, came to Artaxerxes, Nehemiah might not have been in his presence at that point to be able to try to counteract the decision that was made at that point. All we know is the decision is made, and he knows that the response has gone, and he might have even heard about the, uh, the, the response, or maybe not, because he does ask about the people and about the city. So a letter has been sent. I know these are opponents of the Jews. I know they've had Artaxerxes' authority. What have they done? What has happened to the city? What has happened to the people? The response, verse 3, to Nehemiah, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity, that is, those exiles who have returned back to the land, previous exiles, are in great distress and reproach. They're suffering tremendous hardship. Distress probably here more physical because of the reproach, which would be more emotional. They've been beaten down physically, and they're being beaten down verbally. And the result is physical and emotional. They are, to use a common term, that they're in total depression, which probably has spiritual manifestations. They're probably wondering, where's God? And by the way, I think we have good evidence for that impl implied because it was around this time period that the Psalms were collected into the book as we have them today. Now, the Psalm, many of them existed. Most of the Psalms are pre-exilic. But how many times in the Psalms do you hear, how long, O Lord? Lord, where are you? Lord, are you taking notice? Lord, do you see what our adversaries are doing? Now, if this is the prayer book being used at the temple, well, providentially, right after this, well, we get into one of those psalms of those corporate laments of, Lord, do you not see? Do you not behold? Particularly uh, book 3, Psalm 73 to 88, uh, 89. Lord, have you forgotten your covenant? And that basically is the covenant with David. But have you forgotten? Don't, don't you see our distress? Aren't, where are you? 
Not that they hadn't been seen in individual laments during you know David's life in book one and two. <laughs> How many times he, uh, you know, Lord, I need your help. Lord, be not far far off. But I mean, it really really crescendos in book three, seventy three to eighty nine. And I know you don't want any further reading, but if you'd like to read those psalms as a background of what I'm saying this evening, you're perfectly willing to do so. So yeah, there, there's, there is physical and, and uh, emotional uh, depression that I think is probably brought on a level of spiritual depression as well. And of course, by the time the, the walls are completed, how that's going to change from discouragement to encouragement, from distress and reproach. And of course, we're going to see the physical and, and, uh, and uh, verbal attacks uh, that are going to come before us in chapter 4 and again in chapter 6 with the internal problem, chapter 5. So Nehemiah, ne Nehemiah deals with everything we just saw in the 10 chapters that we call Ezra. You know, the, the, the outward opposition, the inward problems, has to deal with them both within 52 days as the walls are being built. So don't think you have a hard ministry. I mean, in, <laughs> you know, in less than two months, Nehemiah has to really deal with it all and get a wall built. And God, well, the good hand of God was upon him. And so the people, they, they are in a, a very tenuous situation. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates burned with fire. So, so the people are depressed. And uh, the city has a measure of destruction. And obviously with the wall broken down, the gates burned with, with fire, it is, it is unsecure. It is unprotected. So you might say that uh, the people are depressed and so so the physical conditions of the city. So it's just everything is depressing. And notice Nehemiah's initial reaction. And by the way, I correlate this to Ezra's reaction in Ezra chapter 9. I heard these words, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourn for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I sat down and wept and mourned for days. So when he first heard it, he was overwhelmed with sorrow. And that sorrow didn't abate. Actually, it seemed to intensify as, uh, as the months passed. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, how long the fast was, the required fast, the only required fast in the Old Testament goes from sunup to sundown on the Day of Atonement. This seems to be now, did he fast for the whole four months? Don't know, did he fast during certain intermittent periods? But certainly he was praying, and the essence of what he prayed is, uh, is given, although it culminates in the prayer that we have in verses 5 to 11, as you get to the end, was the prayer he gave on the day that he was going to come into Artaxerxes' presence. Because at the end, he, he, he uh, says, make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. So we have recorded by Nehemiah is, okay, this was the prayer I prayed the day I was going in to see Artaxerxes. But what, he, what he's stating in verse 4 is this prayer on that culminating day basically is this, the prayer that he had been praying for four months. Obviously, make your servant successful today hadn't been going on for four months, unless, unless he wanted every day whether this was the day. But I think the implication is, I was praying, I was praying the prayer 
over four months to culminate on that day and having given the general response, which is uh, uh, that uh, they're your servants and be attentive to the prayer of your servant, the prayer of your servants who delight to do your will and revere your name. And that is obviously to, uh, to, to reverse their situation and to provide for them because they are back in uh, the land. Oh, by the way, today, uh, to help fulfill that prayer, make me successful as I talk to this man. All right, so uh, it gives us the backdrop, and then just a couple chapters later, we have Nehemiah's prayer. So let me just uh, drop down. Here we have the prayer of Nehemiah. And again, I've given you a schematic that you can follow. He's going to begin and end. You know, we'll let your ear be attentive, your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servants, which I'm praying now, day and night. Obviously, we see the invocation. It is Yahweh, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Interestingly, both the Jewish name, Yahweh, God of heaven, uh, the, uh, the way in which uh, they communicated that to, uh, to the Persians, to their pagan neighbors. So Yahweh, who's the God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Boy, this is important. He's getting ready to ultimately intercede before Artaxerxes. He needs to be reminded when he gets into the presence of the, of the most powerful man on the face of the earth that he is serving the great and awesome God that is greater than any human potentate. Great and awesome, but also faithful, preserves the covenant and loyally for those who love him and keep his commandments. So he's, he's a God who is powerful, and he's a God who is faithful. And we need a reminder of that. There's a sense in which we, we have to be overwhelmed with the transcendence of God and also be assured by the imminence of God. Put a little bit of your theology into practice at that point like Nehemiah. Keep him transcendent. He's never daddy. He is the great and awesome God. But he's also tender like a father in his imminency. So uh, keep, keep, keep that in your mind. It's not just the prayer of Nehemiah. You can go through Scripture. Keep those categories, and you'll see it again and again. Just the greatness of God, his transcendence, and yet his willingness to to interact with his people as a loving father, his imminence. And of course, of all people now, with our faith in Jesus Christ, and uh, knowing the Father as Christ knew the Father, we, we know both aspects even more intimately than an Old Testament saint. And of course, he says that he is praying, and notice too, he is also praying continually, night and day, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel which have sinned against you. Oh, I am my father's house of sin. Here is, here is the link back to chapter 9. This has happened in response to Israel's sin that Ezra confessed. I am my father's house of sin. That what I have heard is, is, is the immediate sin, and yet it goes back to uh, it's a previous, we've acted corruptly against you. We've not kept your commandments, statutes, ordinances, which you commanded your servant Moses. Now remember the words you commanded, Moses. If you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me, keep my commandments, do them. Though you were scattered, I will, I, I will gather you from the remote part of the heavens and bring you back to the place where I have chosen to dwell. And a measure of that has taken place. Now, again, not the full fulfillment, but a measure of 
God's promise underlying the, because of the Abrahamic covenant, underlying the Mosaic covenant. And so we are dealing with uh, Deuteronomy 30. They have been scattered. And God promises in the future to bring them back. And even though this is not the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 30, it is an evidence that God, again, has at least brought a remnant back to Jerusalem where the temple has been rebuilt. They are your servants and the people whom you redeem by your great power and your strong hand. A reminder again, God, you're the one that's done this. They are your people now at this point. They're your unfaithful people again, all over again. That's where chapter 9. You're the one who's faithful, not them. But they are your servants. They are your people. Because they're in your land, in your place, accomplishing your will for them. And who knows, but this is foundational to what you're going to do to bring a full fulfillment of your promise to Abraham for Israel in the future. And uh, so a reminder of what God had done. And so, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, the prayer of your servants. And Nehemiah was not alone in this prayer. Obviously, he had his, uh, his brother and those who came with him and uh, assumed that there were others who were faithful to the Lord praying to join him in this prayer. And so the prayer for your servants who delight to fear your name implied, obviously, do and accomplish your will in them, your services, as he just uh, said in the previous verse, verse 10. And then singular servant me, Make me successful today and grant me compassion before this man. And so there is Nehemiah's prayer. And uh, I want to give an exposition of chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. But we've run out of time today, so we're going to begin with that tomorrow. You can see the outline is in your notes. You can drop down to confronting calamity. You can see my three-part uh, outline there. And we'll start off with that uh, tomorrow. But um, hopefully you see the link in between Nehemiah 1 and what has gone previously in, uh, in Ezra. Historical link, it, the, the, the circumstances. If you understand what has uh, happened in uh, chapters 4 and 7 recorded in Ezra, you understand the historical circumstances. And then I do want to, again, answer um, uh, Eskenazi and others that would say that Nehemiah is less spiritual. Uh, do hear the echoes of Ezra's prayer in Nehemiah's prayer. See, too, how he anchors what he is praying in Scripture. He, too, like uh, Ezra, identifies himself with the people and their sin. We have acted corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments, statutes, nor ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. He identifies with the people. It's not them. He's, pray he's praying about us and our sin. Well, he's not, he's not part of that. He's... He's, he's in Susa. He's about 1,300 miles away from the problem in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem, a little further away than, uh, than Babylon. And yet he identifies. It, it, it's us. And he identifies himself, I think, at the very end. Now, I was the cupbearer of the king. Why he is praying for himself and not just all the Israelites is because he realizes I'm the one ordained by God who can change the situation. To use uh, uh, Esther chapter 4, I was called for such a time as this. I'm the cupbearer of the king. 
And now providentially, God has put me in the one place to interact with the one man who can make the decision to change the circumstances of my people in Jerusalem. And so he's not only motivated to pray, he is also motivated to act. And what I want to do at the beginning of tomorrow, because uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter 2 is a great example of the conundrum between praying, knowing that God will answer prayer, but he will answer prayer through a man who will be very, very wise in his interaction with the king. He knows he knows the king. He knows, he knows how to approach the king. He does it right. Now, the consequences, that's why he's praying, you can do it right and it can all blow up in your face. You need to be dependent upon the Lord. But the conundrum on prayer, why do I pray if, if God is going to do it anyway? But prayer doesn't take away human responsibility to do it right. And a great example of that is in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Hopefully that whets your appetite to be here on time tomorrow when we begin with about a 20-minute exposition of, of Nehemiah's approach to Artaxerxes, a man who depended upon God. But that didn't mean he didn't study the man in the situation well enough to make his appeal to be the best it could be from a human standpoint at that point. So I've kind of given you away the big idea of what we're going to see. But I'm a preacher. I want to preach it. <laughs> so, and, and I love it because, because Nehemiah allows us in these eight verses to enter into the experience. You're going to live with Nehemiah in these eight verses. You're, you're going to feel your feet kind of turn to, your legs to putty, and, and, and can I, you know, am I going to make it or not? I mean, he puts the pathos into, you know, into what he speaks here. Uh, you, you, you live emotionally, you know, with Nehemiah wondering, at the end of this, am I going to be the hero or dead? By the way, and that's a very, very good place to be because when God answers his prayer here, he goes to Jerusalem with a lot of confidence that this is the will of God, and he's going to need it, as we're going to see tomorrow, in the rebuilding of the wall. And he's, he's going to have to become a, a tower of spiritual strength for the people in Jerusalem. And that began through his own prayer and his own interaction with Artaxerxes and seeing the good hand of God upon him. And gentlemen, we need that. We need to know that God is with us and we're the center of his will to be the pillar of strength we need to be in serving God and ministering to his people. And once again, Nehemiah, this portion of Ezra and Nehemiah is not just a history lesson. Hopefully in the end we'll gain some of that confidence to be that kind of a man of spiritual strength that God is looking for even in our own day. Well, with that, we'll bring it to an end for today. And uh, tomorrow we'll be looking particularly at uh, chapters 2 through 8 of Nehemiah, if I can stay on track and not preach too much. We'll, uh, we'll keep marching through. But uh, again, have a very blessed rest of the day. And whatever time you have, Go back to Ezra and Nehemiah, or if you want to very quickly, about an hour, you can read very quickly through Psalm 73 to 89. If you want to get some of the maybe emotional place where these people were at that point, they would uh, resonate very much. I mean, those are the basic prayers of the, of the exiles. Not, not all are exilic prayers, but I mean prayers the exiles prayed. Um, is really in, in that part of, uh, of the Psalter. So uh, uh, if you want a, a little bit of devotional uh, 
material as you're going through the course. That would be a place you might want to read tonight. All right, we're going to pick it up at that point tomorrow. And uh, Lord bless you in the meantime. Have a good day. Tomorrow's the hardest day. The day before the end is always the hardest day to plug through because you're tired and tomorrow's not here yet. I mean, which is Friday. I mean, fr Friday, now we're on the last day. We get a fresh burst of energy. Tomorrow's going to be the hardest day of the course. But it's also going to be a very important day because we're going to get to Nehemiah 8 at the end. And boy, that's, that's worth coming back for tomorrow. So, all right. See you then.